The race to 5G is on, and the battle for talent is getting fierce. Welcome to 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, a podcast dedicated to helping you face the future workforce head on. Navigate this challenging talent landscape with innovative strategies to attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work, only here on 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, CEO of Broadstaff Talent Solutions. Hello, and thank you for joining me today on 5G Talent Talk. My name is Carrie Charles, and I am your host, and I am so happy to see you. I'm excited for today's conversation because uh, I have somebody very special with me. Uh, His name is Tony Grayson. He is a technology executive. And get this, he is a former submarine commander for the U.S. Navy. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that in a minute. He's the 2015 Vice Admiral Stockdale recipient for inspirational leadership. And we're going to learn about his leadership secrets in a moment as well. And he's also a veteran advocate. He is the general manager currently for Compass Data Centers. Tony, thank you for joining me today. So excited about this conversation. So am I, Carrie, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So let's hear it. Let's hear about the submarine your history as a submarine commander your <laughs> your your how did you get to where you are today you know tell us the story if you can and and i know it could probably take hours over drinks but let's try it <laughs> yeah no 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 worries at all yeah it's super super different path to tech so 21 years in the u.s navy um in submarines um and i chose submarines just because it's that last vestige of command where you could actually be alone and unafraid so if you can imagine 38 years old, the CEO, like in an aircraft, you can talk to your boss, care, you know, a ship, you can talk to your boss, anything else you can talk to your boss in a submarine, you can't talk to your boss. It's just you and 150, you know, people younger than you uh, doing work out there where you have to make decisions and, you know, you're, no one knows you're there. And if you get caught, you're probably front page of CNN. So uh, my <laughs> lifelong goal was really to command my own submarine. And so I did that. Um, you know, in 2013, I, I took command of USS Providence, SSN 719 out of Groton, Connecticut, uh, had three and a half years of command, absolutely loved it. But, you know, during that time, that was, I probably spent about 80% of my time away from my family. And so that was, you know, you kind of get to that point where you achieve your life goal at that point, and you kind of reassess where you are in your life. And I felt like, over those 20, 21 years, I missed a lot of my kids growing up in, in their life and, you know, had left everything on my spouse to take kind of take care of. It's like, hey, honey, go figure it out yourself. And here I'm going to go out to do cool stuff on the submarine. So I, I got out and lucky enough, I was, you know, able to go work uh, for Facebook at that time and originally was going to take over the EMEA data center operations based out of Dublin. But you know, as we were going through this interview process and I had talking to some of these hiring managers, I'm like, wow, I, I kind of didn't know how much about cloud I knew, but a submarine actually has like 14 to 15 megawatts of IT load. So we have a substrate, you know, we have an overlay, we have, you know, graphic user interfaces, we have storage, we have HPC. So I could actually speak cloud without knowing I could speak cloud. And so I kind of, my job went from, Instead of going to Dublin, which I, we've been trying to get to Europe forever and move out there uh, to kind of more on the IT side, so more of the networky side, more of the construction side based out of Medlow Park. So absolutely love Facebook, um, but coming out of 21 years in the military, they don't pay you that much. And I'm going, I was, you know, kind of buy real estate with 20 year old kids with RSUs. So no offense to them, but we couldn't afford it. So my choices are live in you know east bay and take a two-hour bus ride in or move and so moved up to seattle uh where i was stationed out of twice here just west of seattle on bainbridge island and i was flying the nerd bird down so for those that don't know what the nerd bird is it's a flight that leave it's usually alaska for most of us going from seattle to san francisco leaves on you you fly down monday morning first thing and you fly back thursday so it's not a signed seat but it's you and your closest friends who normally based in Seattle and moved down there. So I did that for about six months, but that's kind of why I left the military. Um, And then got a great job at AWS, where I was doing a lot more of the construction side and and design side in the data centers. Um, And then had a great opportunity to go over to Oracle, 
and do something new and different, um, doing network side, which turned into um, kind of the data centers and more of their cloud strategy. And so I was there about four, four and a half years, but, you know, about a year and a half ago, um, you know, I was talking to a lot of my mentors and stuff. And what I really saw and had a passion for was to try to build something, you know, uh, loved Oracle, loved doing, but essentially I was a cost center. So I was building to support their IS pass and SAS, which is awesome. And I love that. Um, but I kind of wanted to build something that I could kind of, you know, brainstorm with, you know, tweak, get out there, market yeah. and sell. So um, Chris Crosby, one of my mentors said, why don't you kind of come over and, you know, he had bought two businesses in 2018. One was focused on software and the other one was focused on this monster business. So I came over here, I guess, about 17, 18 months ago to Compass to take over this business. And it's, I'm a total technology and ops person. I I wanted to kind of try to run the business. And so this is the greatest way to do it because I, I have training wheels. So, you know, I, I don't have to go raise money. I just go to my parent company and ask for money and they help me with my hiring. And if I need or learning or helping, then I have this great, you know, board and and great execs around me from Compass to to teach me the way. So that's kind of how I got to where I am right now. Wow. So tell me more about Compass. Yeah, Compass. Uh, it's Compass is a, a data center company servicing, you know, all the cloud and and platform providers, uh, U.S., uh, Canada, and Europe, and expanding more. Um, and you know, they're kind of. What they bring is kind of you know kind of more of the modular construction. You know, what I love about them, they're partners. So they see, you know, and we're working with them, you know, kind of the, my previous companies too. So, you know, they kind of see customers that, you know, it's not necessarily as a supplier customer relationship, it's a more of a partner relationship. So let's figure out how we can both be successful. But they're also, you know, they're probably one of the only companies that are out there that I know that have this R and D budget that are looking at more of sustainability looking at new ways to do business. Um, and so, you know, they're building around the world. And so love the Compass and I love, and you know, what I really got also from Compass is they really do put culture first. And I've always been at companies with culture, but culture has been kind of like a, you know, a thing that you read off to the side that you might do it at, at Compass, strat you know, Compass really puts that, that, you know, that, that culture first. And I finally kind of get that quote, you know, you know, uh, strat or uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yep. And what they're really saying is if you follow the culture, you know exactly where to go. You don't have to ask a lot of questions because you know exactly what you're, what, you know, the team's going to say around you. So, you know, that's kind of what I'm learning at Compass, you know, kind of uh, here and doing. And, and what I'm specifically focused on is kind of, you know, we have this, we have this centralization centralization of everyone going from enterprise to the cloud because it was easier, it was cheaper. But now we're starting to see regulations, we're starting to see latency, we're starting to see bandwidth, we're starting to see financials start to de-write, you know, kind of decentralize what the cloud is doing. And I'm not saying hyperscale data centers are gonna go away. I just think we're gonna have this, what we're terming the fourth internet when we start to have all these networks and we have true 5G that can actually get a lot of data from these endpoints, it's not going to have to go to Ashburn, Virginia, or Phoenix, or Chicago. You're going to have to have a lot of these local nodes. And so what, what I am focused on building are these kind of the facilities to house these local nodes, but not as a CapEx, more as a turnkey OpEx where, you know, kind of business. So kind of at the leading edge of, of edge, and we can debate what edge is all, the, all you want, but that's kind of what we're focused on. So somebody reached out to me and said, you have to interview Tony on your show. You have to. And then the more I learned about you and read about you and watched some interviews, you know, I'm, I'm just fascinated because you see the ecosystem from different perspectives, right? I mean, with your experience with Facebook and AWS. And so I, I want to ask you some questions that it, it, we're going to jump around a bit. And Sounds great. we're, we're going to, I just want to <laughs> just get your perspective, right? <laughs> so no, sounds great. Okay, good. Hang on. Just hang on here. Um, so let's talk about 5G, right? 5G promised to change everything. So why hasn't it really happened yet? To be honest, I think it's just, it's it's been too expensive. You know, 5G, from my perspective, is you're going to have to gut your existing infrastructure system and rebuild a new a new infrastructure system. There's a toll transport layer that's going to be required to do to take care of this bandwidth. You know, you can't rely on these old towers 
with this old edge, you know, these old telco huts on the bottom of it. It's kind of, and so everyone's been ch kind of choking on the bill. And, but I think now, and if I'm talking just the states, you know, the U.S. government is investing a lot of money right now in networks. So mid, middle mile, last mile transit, and this is all the bead funding. And, it, and it's like the broadband infrastructure bill, which is like 44 point, you know, 44 billion, which will help fund all this transport. And then you're also starting to get companies start to develop this 5G private network. So you're getting private investment into this. And then hopefully we'll finally get this whole, you know, millimeter wave and, and kind of all those frequencies worked out so we can actually actually have 5G. But I think once we have tr that true transport network, it's going to explode because I mean, it's we're, we're everything's generating so much data right now. But now when you have the transport network that can take all the data, people will write the platforms that will do this. And then so instead of, you know, machine to people, you will have machine to machine to machine, and you'll have more of this network that's going to be needed. And it's going to go, at least I think it's going to, you know, it's going to just right. explode. And we're not talking like a linear, we're talking like an exponential. And I think, you know, we're going to go from I think the third internet, if, if I'm I, if I'm messing this up, I apologize for the analysts out there. I think we're going to go from like 1 billion nodes and by nodes being like a, a phone to like 27 trillion nodes in the space of just a couple of years, because then that real player is going to be there and we're going to have all these platforms that are going to do it. And that's, that's they're going to start to have this concept of data gravity, in which case, you know, data gravity is you bring the compute to where the data is being stored because it's just too cost prohibitive to transport that that data anywhere else. So that will make this decentralized kind of, you know, environment that we're having. And let's be honest, if you're driving a Tesla and you hit a pothole, do you really want that data to go to Ashburn to let all the other Teslas know that you hit a pothole? No, it's going to have to have some edge architecture, local infrastructure that's going to have to support it. And, and from my perspective, our industry is not ready for that. We are very, very good at building 500 acre campuses that are massive. We're not good at saying a thousand distributed locations around the U.S. all with a certain latency and a certain requirements. It's, and and that's what we're trying to focus on. But I do think it's mm -hmm. it is the future, and it's what's going to end up happening. And that's going to be the smart cities, the smart roads, all that kind of stuff. So you talked a bit about broadband. What what do you think is the outlook for 2023 for rural broadband? And, you know, you, you mentioned programs, you know, there's various programs. One is BEAD. Can you, can you uh, yeah, I think, tell us what BEAD is? Yeah, so the BEAD, oh, I, I, I should know what the acronym means, but it's, it's roughly, it's going after the digital divide. And so it's, we're putting yeah. 42 to $44 billion of federal governments in the state hands based on FCC maps, which are going to be an argument at broadband maps as it is. But what mm -hmm. we're really trying to do is use government capital to build private enterprise to build cheap broadband out to the rural areas because i mean everyone thinks that the us has this massive broadband and people have easy access if we actually had that then starlink or leo satellites would not be needed it, it doesn't right. exist i mean there are people in rural areas that are paying dollars and dollars per megabits and and but we in in the you know kind of metro areas don't understand that it just it it really creates this huge digital divide. So that's really what it's at. And there's like the COVID Act I had, I think, I mean, you know, I'm getting these numbers from like 10 billion. And that was really to start start this. We had a middle mile, which was 1 billion, and then the 40, and then the beat is 44. So roughly it's 77 billion the US is spending. And so, you know, by 2025, 2025, 26, they're going to have 77 billion new dollars spent. And improving aggregation points, this broadband network, which the 5G can build off of. So that's why when I say the edge is coming, we've been talking about the edge forever. No, the edge is really coming because now you're going to have the transport layer to develop these cool apps and platforms that everyone really wants. You know, Tony, um, there are so many acronyms. OK, and, and telecom technology, it's unbelievable. So the fact that you, you cannot remember all of them, it's, it's literally hundreds of thousands, right? So, uh, so there's a, uh, no, that, that's, 
that's so interesting. And each one Broadband of these broadband equity access and deployment. Whoa! Yes. There you got yes. it. Yes, oh, no, I had a good. I had a good one. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Look, it's fine. It's fine. I didn't expect you to, to know. What but no one, is, no but... one really knows about this program. I mean, it really is a huge investment by the U.S. government to really go after this digital divide and bring broadband to areas. I mean, it's. I mean, we are at areas where, like, people don't even have the ASNs. Like, they backhaul like campuses, like college campuses don't even have their own ASN and they backhaul another way to get on. It's just, it's mind blowing. And it, and, and if you go over to Europe, they're not like that. I mean, it's just, you know, EMEA seems to be much farther ahead on how they built their network out. And, and, you know, we can discuss that at a future time and how I think we got there, but it's, it's interesting. Right. Right. So let's talk about sustainability. Yes. Where is, sustainability on telecoms agenda? So I think it's, so this is probably gonna not make, not what people wanna hear. So I, I, I have a view of sustainability. We need to take the baby steps. And so I think some people, you know, we have set 2050 goals, but I think some companies feel like 2050 goals are someone else's problem. Like that's my successor's problem. Um, so we have to say 2050, cause that's what the market expects. But for me, sustainability is never really going to change until it, it hurts their pocketbooks, so it affects their business, or there's regulations that kind of come out of it. And so let's look at Europe as a great example of, of kind of that stuff. They have a thing called green financing. And so if your company is green financed, you get a different interest rate than a company that's not green and green finance. So, you know, you have a push towards sustainability on how you want to do that. Plus, there's great companies that are out there that are funding infrastructure right now that um, that really they're going to force the company who's trying to get money from them to meet certain sustainability. But in the end, it's this whole balance of, you know, I got to run my business and be profitable. And I hate yeah. to say it, sustainability is more expensive right now. And so how do you balance that profitability with sustainability? And, and to me, I think we have an opportunity here where we're building out this this edge and kind of what we talked about because you know the edge they're smaller they're cheaper you can try these things like pem fuel cells like solid oxide fuel cells you know pv you know pv so photo you know photoelectric generation uh, with battery backups at low cost and less risk i mean people are afraid to try these big sustainability projects because they don't know what's going to work they don't know what what's going to have the less carbon footprint so let's instead of trying to solve world hunger, let's, let's take this, you know, let's use the phrase, you know, go slow to go fast. Let's take this small incremental steps. Let's try something and let's see if that works and let's build on that. But I think we have to look beyond, you know, the greenwash and we have to look beyond the carbon credits. Cause that's just, that's allowing you to bypass the problem and let's put the regulations in place that actually force us to do stuff instead mm -hmm. of just, you know, Hoping our fingers and and praying that they'll do the right thing. And so, you know, to me, the ESG is interesting because we we tend to focus just on the E as environmental and sustainable, and we have the S and the G, and that's also super important. But you know, if on the E side, let's let's start putting where our money, where our mouth is, and let's start taking these baby steps. But you know, I think a lot of people have thrown goals out there that they're not quite sure how to meet yet, and they're trying to figure it out. Right. One of my mentors said, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. So and, and, we're, and it's almost like we're getting this analysis paralysis. It's like we're we don't know what first just take a step. Guess what? It's probably going to be wrong. You debate about it for <laughs> 10 years. You're probably going to be wrong. Just take one small step and then go and 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 see what regulations, see what works. And then mm -hmm. if that doesn't, then then change the regulation. I mean, I think you have to start somewhere. I mean, look at California. California has pretty much said no more tier two diesels. And right. everyone's like, how are you going to do that? And they're like, well, not my problem. You figure it out. I mean, what a way to drive innovation and sustainability just by saying, can't do it, can't do it. So, you know, it, it it's the permitting that's going to drive the innovation, which will make companies do something different. So, so speaking of something different, what do you see on the horizon for with cleaner energy? Oh, so anything I, exciting. And so I hate to say this because I'm at my background is nuclear. I have to say SMRs are, I think, fascinating to me. And I think they're fascinating because, you know, the nuclear industry has always been highly regulated as it should be. But 
you know, we've been focused on these massive power plants that are hidden off in the middle of nowhere because no one wants it near them that have to get all these counties and states in countries to agree on the regulations that, that are surround that. But now we have these smaller modular reactors. And so we're going from like, you know, gigawatts of power down to like 70 or 60 megawatts of power that are built in a factory to the same spec as those of these, these, these spoke units are, which are kind of peppered around. And that allows you to, you drive costs down, you have the same quality standard, you can transfer your operational lessons learned from unit to unit as you do it. And if I speak here in the States, they've actually recognized these as these reactors as something different. And so now your planning actually starts at your fence line. And so what that allows you to do is you can actually bring these reactors closer to where that's needed and, and put them in more areas um, to where they're needed. And we're not talking fantasy. I mean, there's, there's, there's great designs that are out there that it probably will be 2035. And this is like the sodium based reactors um, that just don't have a lot of data to use them. But then you have data that are essentially, I hate to say this, submarine reactors uh, that are based on those designs that we have a lot of data for that are in the states that are already approved. And we're talking four to five years and you can have four to 500 megawatts of a relatively cheaper mm -hmm. power. Um, but then there's also stuff into, you know, using uh, actual fuel in what we're calling fast fission reactors to actually use that fuel so you don't have to make new fuel. Um, there's also, you know, some of these reactors like rea nuclear batteries that we put in like these satellites and spaceships to look at that kind of as small and take those to areas, I think. But by making energy cheap, you provide that innovation. I mean, I think that people, once again, here in the West, we don't realize it, that a lot of the energy doesn't have access to cheap power. Um, but once we they get access to cheap power, then they can actually start working on things. They can innovate. And so to me, I'm just most excited about these, these small modular reactors because I think costs are low. I think the designs are really good. They're based on passive design. So, you know, we can we can talk Chernobyl, Three Mile, and Fukushima would actually happen there. But I think, you know, the design, a lot of passive design, a lot of safety features that are in here um, that, and they're cheap enough that we can actually put them out in, in different locations in the world. And so that to me is the most exciting thing of, of, and that generates, you know, green hydrogen, which can go into fuel cells. I mean, this the sky's the limit kind of with, with nuclear wow. from my perspective. You know, you talked earlier about technology changing things exponentially and, and moving so fast. And there, of course, you know, we, we cannot stop this interview until we talk about workforce, right? Because the yeah. workforce has changed so much just over the past two years. So what do you see as some strategies for hiring with today's workforce, where we are today? Yeah, I think we, our generations are super naive. I mean, and the way we think, we think everyone thinks like us. We think, you know, you know I'm probably you know, the tail end of that where people want to go to a company for 20 years, they want a pension, that's how they work, that's how they think. That's not how the current generation works. They want to be challenged, they want to be included. And I don't think we recognize that. So we're still trying to put our values of a system onto what that new culture, I mean, the you know, kids nowadays, they're raised on social media, they think differently than us, they, they, they take in information differently than us, they learn differently, but we're still trying to jam them into this old mentality of, of you come to work and you work 40 hour, you know, 40 hour work weeks, you stay at your desk, you don't walk around, you know, it's like, it's, it's so different in the way they're thinking. And then, you know, I also think that we, we're putting too much of an emphasis on performance too or experience. I mean, we're growing at such an exponential rate. Guess what? We don't have people who have this background or the people who mm -hmm. have this background are gray hair and are retiring. And so you got to figure out how to bring these people in. So I think we need to really focus on, you know, kind of will, which is, you know, the, the, the they want to get in there. They want to do a good job. They want to learn kind of loyalty, meaning that once they learn, they want to kind of stay for the company. And, and then instead of this performance, I mean, you're going to have to teach them. You're going to have to make them learn. You can't just sit there and say, you shall have an MBA from Harvard and you shall have all that. Like that stuff doesn't exist anymore. You have to bring them in, 
And there's a, we have a new term called quiet quitting. People work, yeah. they don't, they're never going to tell you they're going to quit. They just don't show up to stuff or they get another job. I mean, that's, that's today. I mean, people stay for pay, but more people are going to stay if they believe in the mission that they're doing or their job they're doing or the environment they're doing. So focus on that. And I don't think we do that enough. I think we just treat everyone as a disposable asset. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm so big into veterans because veterans want to get out there. They want to work and they've been, con you know, I hate to use the word condition, but they see the bigger mission. They, they want to work like if we're working together, Carrie, they want to work for to, to help you succeed and the company succeed. They're not out there just to punch the clock. And, you know, they, they're that overall mission kind of thing and that overall company kind of thing. And that focus really what is what gets them. And so that's why I want to help vets. And, and, and most people don't know this, but you know, vets, some of them are on food stamps. Some of them are going to mm -hmm. food banks, raising five or six kids. They get paid next to nothing. We need to help them across that river sticks into the civilian, give them the tools they need to be successful because they're going to crush it. They may not know as much as other people who come out of this industry, but they typically switch job every two years. So their ability to ramp, pick up these jobs is great. And, you know, they're also great team workers. So, you know, that's kind of how I think we need to solve this workforce instead of just looking to people that don't exist anymore. Wow. No, well said. Absolutely well said. Tony, how do we get more veterans? You know, how do we hire more veterans? I mean, are there, where are the programs? Where do we look? You know, I, there are a lot of programs out there and I think they're all disparate programs. They're all well-intentioned working for the same thing, but they're working in silos. And so, you know, we have a group called Infrastructure Masons and it, you know, was put together by Nina Nelson. It was to get all these large technology sectors. It's kind of like OCP under one room to standardize on how we're doing our business and kind of thing. And under that, we have a veterans association, which we're trying to, it's the, it's to get the word out. And we're not trying to preference any company over another company. We're just trying to get into these veterans organizations globally. And, you know, when we talk vets, mostly we talk, unfortunately, U.S. vets, but there's vets in every part of the world. They all think the same way. We're all taught the same way that, and they're all equally can do this kind of job. We should be looking at globally, how do we approach these vets? And we don't want to rob them from their military because they need them, but we want to be the first person at the door to help them to be successful um, because it's just two totally different things. And so I think, you know, we need all need to come together under one banner and, and help them teach them to fish. You know, they can go find their own fish and what job they want, but we should show them what program managers do is project managers, sales, you know, yeah, computer science, you know, networking, infrastructure, construction, you know, you, you know, all this stuff they can do. They just don't know it. Um, and I think there's a ready-based talent that we're not utilizing right now. Instead, they're going to factories or they're truck driving. And, and, you know, it's it. And we also have this overemphasis too on officers. You know, there is a great, you don't need a degree to be successful. I mean, yeah this is real, it's all experience. And what college tries to do is to give you that experience in four years. These, some of these people have been learning this experience for 20 years and they probably do a better job at a college, you know, so when we get to the degree. So I just think it's, you know, we need to lean on these programs and help them out and, and teach them to fish. And, and, you know, I think that we'll be pleasantly surprised in how well they can help our business. Wow. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I'm a veteran and I was enlisted and I don't have a college degree. So I'm one of those people that you just talked about. So and it, it's, it's just stupid. I mean, it's, it, who, it, once you get to that point, who cares? I mean, in fact, you know, I would rather hire right now an E9 than I would rather hire an 06 and 07. I know there's some people who don't understand that, but you know, that the enlisted, guess what? They get the work done. I, as a sub commander, this is what I did. Cobb, <laughs> make it happen. And the, and the cop made it happen was my senior enlisted. Okay. So they, you know, they actually can do this kind of stuff. And I think, you know, we don't put an emphasis on really understanding what that senior NCO can bring. Um, instead, we focus on the JOs, which I, I'm not saying anything against JOs or mid-level officers or senior officers, but it's just you get something different with that, with that senior NCO who actually, you know, gets stuff done well. You know, we sit and drink my coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
we we need to look at the whole picture when it comes to talent, especially it, it, when we don't have enough of it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's good. So, you know, I get a lot of comments on uh, after the podcast interviews that people really love the leadership advice and leadership principles. And, you know, I'd like to ask you, what leadership lessons did you learn from being a submarine commander? Yeah, so... You know, I think, you know, from a subgreen commander, it's just weird progression. So, you know, I think early on you 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 manage by, I mean, you, you have your senior enlisted to help you out, but you really you you associate every how everyone's doing with your own success. And so unfortunately, you're in micromanagement mode. And then you get to a point where you can't micromanage anymore and you actually have to delegate. But you can't just delegate and and then you know just use fear to do that. And to be honest, I was like that. And I'm I'm not embarrassed to say that, you know, I you know had this micromanagement aspect when I would just you know just keep continually ping on people to get stuff done because I thought that I had to be in control of everything. I you know if I'm doing a movie, I had to be in, in charge of the set. I had to be in charge of the lighting the actors, the makeup, everything. And Rowdy, it's never going to work like that. And so I think I learned during my CO tour, and this kind of went into the Stockdale, was you have to you have to empower them, you have to let them fail, and you have to be able to pick them up there, and you have to be able to teach them, and you have to let go of this ego and this fear of, of being wrong, and you have to instill that into them. You want them to take charge. You want them to make decisions. And if they mess up, guess what? You don't want to be throwing stuff at them. You want to take them and say, hey, what could you have done better? Learn from that lesson. All right, get out there and do it again. I mean, I think, and I, I think that goes into the civilian world too, where, you know, I think we put so much pressure on ourselves that our tech team is our success. But in reality, what we should be doing is empowering a team to be successful. And I have not always been the best at this, and I'm the first person to say it, but you need to empower the team to be successful. And stop having this fear of, you know, things out of your control to, you know, to work and, and morality, let the person hit the ditch. That's how smart people learn. Like you don't, you never learn if you're successful because you don't know if yeah. you're successful because of what you actually did or, or you were lucky or maybe what your team did. You learn by hitting, hitting that ditch going, wow, I shouldn't <laughs> do that again. Um, and I right. think you need to give that, you know, experience and then. We know you, what you would do as a leader is you provide that experience to people. So it's kind of like this incremental feedback. So instead of saying, Carrie, go find me a rockets. What are you thinking, Carrie? You know, is, is that really what you want to do? Well, what about this, this, and this? And so, I mean, this is the whole go slow to go fast. And so, you know, I, I just, mm-hmm. you know, we, we talk all this stuff about, you know, servant leadership and I get it, but I don't think people actually really follow that. I think in the end, you know, fear leads us and we need to just let go of that and really drop that that ego and once you drop that fear and that ego you will be a hundred times better leader because you're empowering your team and that's really what it comes down to so sorry you're a big ramble on there wow. I, just, I just i have some i have some scars let's just say uh on this kind of stuff and, and you know i've i've kind of come to a place where i feel super comfortable with it now on it and it's you know it just comes down to it if your success is your team successful. If they get promoted, that's your success. If they do this stuff, that's your success. You should just be the silent partner that's orchestrating things in the background. And that's all you should want. Hmm. Wow, Tony, that's absolutely brilliant. I, I was talking to my team this morning in a meeting and, and talking about fear actually, and how to turn peer, fear into power. And I think that today's leader, you know, there's a lot of pressure on today's leader. The workforce has changed, you know, with with everything, the generations involved, the, you know, where are we going to work? How are we going to work? The mental health, the flexibility that the workforce is demanding, and then the great resignation and, and retaining people and paying them enough and keeping them engaged. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure. So I, I really honor your authenticity to say, look, I haven't done all this perfectly and and none of us really have, right? We're figuring all this out together. So I just, I really honor, honor you. No, you got to be able to stand up to your boss and say you're wrong. You should be able to stand up to the chairman and say you're wrong. 
Um, and they should give you the freedom to do that. And if they don't, then is that really the place you want to work at? I mean, that's what right. it comes down to. It's, you know, yeah. everyone's opinions valued and there is a lot of pressure and a lot of, you know, force to do this. Right. And this kind of comes to this, this generation, you know, you can't fuse fear with this generation that that's coming in now they're, they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and it's not the job I mean, they, they're, they're going to probably do three or four jobs. I figure up the statistic is, you know, trying to find out what I, you know, my son is now, you know, he's, he's doing that when he's doing did business, but it's doing cybersecurity and he might switch around jobs three or four times in his first couple of years to figure out what he's doing. And I think that's great. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what we should be encouraging. So, you know, long about yeah. Ray, it's, you know, I, I have never, always gotten it right and I won't get it right in the future too but I'm I'm at least trying and if you think you know everything you you are not who you think you are I think every day you can learn something from someone and you can learn something and you're you should be really focused on trying to learn something every single day mm -hmm. Tony this is this has just been insightful and uh wow I've learned a lot so I want to thank you so much for coming on the show um where can we reach you where can we connect with you um, you can either come, you know, kind of compass, you know, the compass data center of site, it's white spaces of service or, or quantum on Lara, but you know, the best way probably is just on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm trying to do YouTube too, but I stink at it. My kids laugh at me all the time, but uh, LinkedIn seems to be the best way, you know, just DM me. I try to respond to all those DMs or just respond to my kind of posts out there too. Love to have conversations. I know I'm not right. And I think, you know, LinkedIn I think oftentimes is rainbows and unicorns and not a lot of challenging challenge me. I want to be challenged. I want to, you know, that's the only way we're going to have the better thinking. Yes. Yes. Tony, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I, I can't wait to get to know you better. And I'm glad this is recorded because I'm going to go take a bunch of notes after this. So thanks so <laughs> thank much you, for Gary. coming. No, on. Thank you. No, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to another informative episode of 5G Talent Talk brought to you by RCR Wireless News, Telecom Careers, and Broadstaff Talent Solutions. As we advance into the future, we promise to bring you the resources you need to navigate this ever-changing landscape of 5G to help you attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work. To access the show notes or leave a review, visit broadstaffglobal.com. Until next time. 